Welcome to the Beyond the Cubicle podcast, episode number seven. Great topic today. Something I hate, but that's super important. And it's an important part of the process when it comes to career growth or changing jobs or, you know, even moving up within the company that you're in sometimes. Resumes. Yes. Those things. We cover a lot in this episode today. What sections should be on your resume? How much information about you and your task and your responsibilities should you include? What are recruiters and hiring managers looking for? And what is the resume selection process really like? Hey, we also briefly get into the issue of employment gaps um, and the differences between genders and how that plays a role in some things. And also why employers view employment gaps the way they do. As always, a little bit of house cleaning before we get into this episode. If you guys have any questions or topic suggestions that you want to see discussed on the show, just drop us a note at podbtc at gmail.com or you can go to our Instagram profile and just hit the email button. To all my Apple device people, go ahead and rate us and leave us a review as well. It helps other listeners find us. And you can also find us on SoundCloud, Stitcher.com, and the Stitcher app, TuneIn.com, and the TuneIn app, and anywhere else you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also find the audio versions of our episodes on YouTube. Just search for the Beyond the Cubicle podcast there, too. Head on over to Facebook and like our page. Just search for the Beyond the Cubicle podcast. Then follow us on Instagram and Twitter at ThisIsBTC. Now the episode, but first... The intro. On today's show, a very important topic. All of these these topics are important, but I think this one is going to be very, very, very beneficial to just about everybody because it's a process that we have to go through multiple times in our careers, most of us. And it is the resume formatting writing preparation process. Mm, right. Writing writing your commercial. Ooh. For you. That's it. <laughs> That's it. So so we should look at resumes like commercials it's for ourselves? You, yes. I don't know you. Uh-huh. It's like I'm watching that burger on TV and the 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 ketchup and sauce is dripping and the onions just sitting there, whatever. And I want that. Why? Because somebody took the time to write the resume or to tell me how good that burger is going to be when I get there. You got to write your resume. It's your commercial. Now, this can be one of the most difficult and challenging processes of the work experience. And the reason I say that is because just even in my own experience, I become terrified when it's time to start putting <laughs> words on the page when it comes to describing myself. Mm-hmm. Because there's a there seems to be a a, a nice balance between um, talking about yourself too much, mm-hmm. talking about yourself too little, mm-hmm. and oftentimes, man, a lot of us are horrible at it. Mm-hmm. Just in previous episode, we talked about mentoring. In that process, I've already come across resumes that I'm like, okay, this is a challenge. And just the explanation of what you did and how you did it and its importance. Yes. Like it's it's a challenge. It's and it's not it we hate talking about ourselves because most of us were raised, most of us, not all of us, don't brag. Sure. You know, just do your just do your deal and everything will be okay. But the reality is you're not bragging. Basically you're you're letting someone know what you can do to help them. Mm-hmm. You know, if your car broke down and and uh, you needed to change a flat tire and I say, Hey, I can help you jack up your car. I've got a jack in my car. I can help you get the lug nuts off of that wheel. I'm not really bragging. I'm simply saying, here are my capabilities to make a difference in your life. And if I look at it that way, uh, I'm not as hesitant to write down what I can do. So here's what we're going to cover today. We already started with a piece of it. I really wanted to get uh, E's 
with you on how we should really be approaching uh, our resumes, right? And just like he said, you know, just like a commercial for yourself. Mm-hmm. Here's what we're, here's what else we're going to cover. We want to look at the selection process, how these machines and how the programs <laughs> that work today, you know, how they work, and how can we make sure that we're we're maximizing our our, our potential for getting our resume selected. Mm-hmm. Then I want to look at the actual human side of the process. Once it's been selected, what's the next step for a human resources um, uh, person or a uh, internal recruiter or external recruiter? What's the process for them um, in their selection process? Then after that, we want to look at the different components that compose a good resume, knowing that some of it is a science and some of it is an art. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, we'll get everybody out of here. So we've already said the resume should be our commercial. It's your commercial. So now that we've kind of gotten that out of the way, mm-hmm. let's talk about what the, the, the from your experience, what is the selection process is? Uh, what, what is the selection process from a from a programming standpoint? Well, a couple of things happen. First of all, most companies have an applicant tracking system. There are certain requirements to make sure that you are hiring fairly. And I know most large companies want to make sure they don't want anybody asking questions as to why they hire, how they hire. So they almost all have applicant tracking systems. Mm -hmm. And these are optical systems. So they scan your resume in. In fact, if anybody uses the big resume, uh, web-based resume uh, clearing posts, they send it in and they actually take your resume and they take the job description and they actually scan to see if the things on your job description are being matched in your resume. And when they do, they get a numerical rating. Mm-hmm. And depending on the numerical rating, if it's high enough, they then send that actual physical resume to a human resource professional at that company. Gotcha. So the computer does the work. They the, figure it out. The initial, so, yes. Okay, so so the, the whole thing about the keywords and making sure you have certain keywords. Yes. What sections of the resume... Um, should we pay attention to to make sure that we're, we're hitting those those keywords? There's a, there's a couple of things. The highlights, and and we'll talk about the length, but you don't have to write down every single thing you've ever done. First right. of all, the book would be so long, and we'd be very sleepy by the time we got <laughs> at the end of it. So what we want, think about what you're applying mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. and think about what they're asking for mm-hmm. and then making sure that you speak to those under skills and abilities. Skills and abilities. Skills and abilities. Now, a lot of people write their resume chronologically. In 19, whatever, I did this. In 2000, whatever, I did this. In 2010, I did this. And that's okay as long as you are capturing uh, what you did and the impact it had on those businesses. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to write the whole history. Write the the awesome stuff Mm -hmm. and what impact it had on uh, the companies that you worked for. So, a, a quick diversion. Mm-hmm. What if in a situation? What, what if there's a situation where maybe the thing that you did in that position, which is part of the job description, mm-hmm. right? But there was not one of these like overall big impacts to the company. It was just there's a process that I had to do every day. Mm-hmm. I did that process. There was not a lot of opportunity outside of that to really do anything else visibly impactful mm-hmm. so then how what, what, like what type of impact does that have how do you how do you word something like well that? there's always an impact but it may not be the oh wow mm-hmm. but there's always an impact for instance let's say my job uh, is in custodial services mm-hmm. and i mop this hallway um every evening mm-hmm. at nine o'clock i'm going to put down on the resume that I do an expert job at stripping the hall, getting the wax down, uh, mopping it, doing whatever I do. And the impact statement there, while it's not wow, uh, allowed my company to present a well, uh, a professional, uh, good-looking, well-designed, well-developed workplace 
for the employees to work. There's always a reason why you do that. Yeah, so, okay, I got you. So there's always, whatever you do, it may not be wow, but there's a reason why you do it, and that's what you put down on the resume. So so every process has an impact. Absolutely. And sometimes we just focus too much on the big wows. That's it. Okay. That's it. So keywords, skills and abilities, Mm -hmm. uh, what other section do we say? Um, You can do it chronologically, Mm -hmm. but make sure that they, that in your, under skills and abilities or capabilities or however you write that down, right. make sure that there you have covered everything that they're asking you for. Okay. Now, you don't want to mimic it. For instance, they say, uh, must be skilled at, you know, Oracle, yada, yada. You don't have to write down skilled at Oracle, yada, yada. Mm. But it's okay to say used Oracle, yada, yada, to do, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The, the, even the machines will be able to see and connect. So it's not a parroting issue. Yeah. It's just make sure you speak to an example of you doing exactly what's on the job, uh, on the job uh, posting. So then once we move from the selection process from the, the, the software, mm-hmm. then it goes to a human. A human. Now, is, is that through what's the best way to ask it? So so let's so let's say I'm looking for a job on Indeed, Career Builder, Monster, right. those are right. the big three that I that I that I can right. remember, right? Right. I see a job posting. It says submit my resume here. Right. I go and I submit my resume. Correct. Where is it going from that particular interface and how does it get to you as a human resource professional? There are some places that actually go out to those aggregators of all this data mm-hmm. and pull. Mm-hmm. And I believe in some cases they have clients where they actually push things to them. Gotcha. So either way, if it's going to Monster, it's going to be either out there for somebody to collect mm-hmm. or as they sell that service to people, mm-hmm. they'll actually push those to places. Gotcha. Okay. And then, yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, because I guess at that point, then whoever has the account goes out and sees it, whether it's an internal recruiter, external Absol- recruiter, absolutely. Or that human resource professional is assigned to that post. Absolutely. They would go out and pull. They'll go out and pull, and okay. they'll look for those keywords, yeah. and they pull them in. Now they're on the human resources desk. Now here's some other things come into play. Mm-hmm. Here is where uh, you're going to watch them get sorted, and I can give you the, <laughs> the hits to this one. They sort them into three piles. There's a yes pile, mm. there's a no pile, and if there's not a lot, there's a maybe pile. Mm. If they got 400, it's only going to be a yes or no. Mm-hmm. First thing they're looking for is grammatical errors. I walked out of a meeting one time and somebody grabbed me, and college graduate person, the resume was so bad that the whole HR department was having comedy night on this on this resume. Wow. It was horrendous. And I didn't want to laugh in the hallway, but we opened the office door, closed it, and fell all over the desk. It was horribly written. Yeah. The person had misspelled their own name. Get no N- way. Misspelled their own name. I'm like, was this a joke? They said, no, this person actually applied for this. So I'm like, what were they doing? Were they watching cartoons while they're writing it? Well, one indictment could possibly be that they probably wrote it in haste at the last minute. Yes. Which... Yeah, kind of speaks to not the type of person you probably want to hire either. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. But they did provide comedy <laughs> for a whole department of people working, and you know, sad, but yeah. that that's real. So the person from HR, they're looking for grammatical errors. Mm-hmm. They're looking for inconsistencies. They're looking for spelling. I mean, if there's ever a time to use grammar check and spell check and have your your, your intelligent friends read it over, don't give it to your friends that are still struggling with cognitive agility, uh, give it to your intelligent friends to look at. And then, you know, hey, does this look right to you? And, and find somebody critical, you yeah. know. That's why I love some of y'all, man. I, I bring it up and say, hey, what does this look like? Right. And I want the real. Don't be nice. Right. Because I'm trying to get a job. Yep. So, uh, and then look for the grammar. They're looking for gaps in employment. So if you were working from 2012 to 2013 at a place, And then you're gone all the way to 2016, Mm -hmm. and there's a blank. You know they want to know that maybe you, you, uh, you know, worked at a state institution. You know, Mm -hmm. present license plates Mm -hmm. during that gap period. So let's pause right there for a second, because I I I think this is this is a good place to to diverge a little bit. Okay. Okay. Gaps in employment. Yes. Okay. I'm sure I already know the answer to this. Sometimes (laughs) it's just good to just. 
to 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 hear it spoken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why is that an important thing? There is okay. I, I'm gonna. I can't say this without being judgmental, but there's an arrogance on the part of many employers mm -hmm. that if there's a gap, either you weren't valuable enough to be hired, mm. or uh, there's some skullduggery in your personal life's history. Real quick story. I was on a plane with a gentleman, and uh, we were flying out to a conference. And he said, I used to look at everybody that had been unemployed for any period of time as something was wrong with them. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was their fault. And that's an arrogant view from an employer. But it's out there. There are people that believe until it happens to them. So we're on the plane. And I, he said, until it happened to me. I said, what happened? He was a district sales manager at a bunch of money. He said, my company laid me off, mm -hmm. and I have not been able to get a sales career going mm -hmm. for two years. He said, but I knew there were gaps, and I knew I couldn't have a gap in my employment, so I bought a laundromat and a pizzeria to show that I'd been an entrepreneur during those time periods. Wow. And I was blown away because I don't have enough money to buy a pizzeria right. when I get laid off. Right. But he said his whole view changed because he now realized anybody can get laid off. Right. And anybody can be without a job for right. a period of time. So that's really what that that's the arrogance when you have a gap in employment. Either something was wrong with you or you've been upstate helping some government uh, government groups. Quick story and then I, I wanna kind of touch on the gap in employment from from another perspective. Like you, you said that that arrogance, man. I like I had a had a moment where I felt bad because I had that same thought. Mm -hmm. uh, a buddy of mine who we worked together for some time, um, recently connected with him and, you know, he shared his experience over the last couple of years and just having a difficult time finding employment. Mm -hmm. Like I know this dude, he's got masters and he's, he's highly intelligent. He's, a good ex guy. he's excellent at what he does. Absolutely. And he's a, he's, he's an expert in certain levels. And when he told me his experience, of resume looking good, getting to parts of the interview, and employers are like, well, um, we're not sure you're going to stick around because you have so much experience. I don't oh, know if this is good for you. Or, absolutely. Uh, you have such a, uh, such a focus on your resume in this one area. Are you going to handle this or are you going to run back to, to the things that, you're, you know. that, you're, that you know? Yes. And I'm just like, Prior to me hearing that story, I'm like, dude, like, how can you not find a job? Like, you have these skills and the tool set. Yes. And he shared that experience, and I'm like, damn. Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You could put down so much on your resume and be so qualified mm -hmm. that you'll never get a job. Wow. If you're more qualified than the boss, mm -hmm. I tell people, once you start getting your advanced degrees, yeah. be very careful. Now they'll get you in, but if you're humble and whatever... But if I had a PhD, there's no way in the world I would put it down on a resume. Mm. Because what that says, when you walk in, Ooh. you're the baddest dude in the room. Ooh. And what boss would want to hire you? Yeah. Not not there. That Okay. okay. That's reality. You know, I'm being real. I'm going to bring that back up when we talk about components when we get to the education section. Okay. Um, okay, like touching on this, um, the gap in employment thing from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I really try, I'm really working on, as a male, mm -hmm. right? It's a male-dominated world. Um, it's a male-focused world, mm -hmm. right? Which is unfortunate. But as a male, I'm really trying to make sure that I am aware and that I'm actively in my mind working to help where I can mm -hmm. and teaching other males about uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. As I learned, I try to share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this gap in employment thing, um, I can see how an employer would definitely use prejudice when it comes to our, our ladies mm -hmm. in that situation because sometimes our ladies take, you know, a couple of years off or a year off to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, raise children or have families or, you know, that type of thing. I mean, in, in your experience and any suggestions that you have, uh, it's there. Um, for young ladies dealing with that situation. Yeah, it's there. You're absolutely. Now, it's against the law for them to say certain things, mm -hmm. but you cannot manage what somebody thinks right. 
in what they do. All the lawsuits that come about is because somebody was dumb enough to say something stupid. Yeah. But I've seen resumes just flipped over and no word spoken. There's no lawsuit because they never said why they didn't choose it. I've surmised as I looked at it and went, hmm. So uh, what is looked at favorably when it's uh, uh, a woman that's had her kids mm -hmm. and she says, hey, my kids are in school now. They're fine. I'm ready to get back into the workplace. Usually that's a pretty positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some prejudice there, but not for the most part. Yes. The biggest prejudice that I've ever seen has been against young women and the usually male person sitting in the seat of power is trying to determine whether or not they're going to go have kids. Mm. And so, I have, so, so in other words, they, have, yes. they they currently don't have children. Yes, but they're they're towing they're not yes. towing, but they're they're making that decision about whether they want to start a family, yes. and how much time they may want to take off. And or, at that point, you'll see uh, people try to get around the the legal because it's illegal to ask somebody that. Right. But you'll 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 see people try to pull shenanigans to figure out. Now she's bright, she's really smart. But is she really going to be here? You know, if she's a newlywed. Is she really going to be around? So as much as we don't like it, and as wrong as we know that it is, does it exist? Absolutely. Gotcha. All right. Um, so so in terms of the the selection process from the the human side. Yes. Um, they They choose it. Yep. Based on, you know, like a, a sorting method. They yes. go yes, no, maybe. Yes. The quick things that they look at when they're doing that, the that initial sorting, what, yeah. what are you looking at? The so, grammar, the gaps, mm -hmm. uh, the spelling. Okay. Then they look for length of service at your jobs. Okay. So let's say uh, you've been working out of school for 10 years and you've had eight jobs. Mm -hmm. That scares them. Because they're looking for continuity. Yeah. If I average that out, that means every year and a couple of months you change jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not hiring you for a year and a couple of months. I want this position filled for a while. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is we're all going to be looking to do better. Yes. But you want to you want to show some st stability. Usually, four years or so is considered stable mm -hmm. in most in most situations. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, you're not flitting around. But when I see the every 18-month thing going on, nah, they're going to decline it. Gotcha. Okay, so the the sorting process, they're reviewing grammatical errors, inconsistencies, gaps in employment, length of service, anything else? Um, pretty much at that point. Uh, now, I do have a, a, a tip I give to people. If your name is hard to pronounce mm -hmm. and you know it, don't be angry at your parents but simply use your initials. Gotcha. And I have seen people flip the resume over based on the name. Wow. And you can't sue because no comment was made. Gotcha. Nobody says I have to hire that person. But I looked at the name and I went, yeah, I pretty much figured out this one. Wow. So those are the things you want to look at. Remember, this is a commercial for you, and the only focus for you is I need this person to call me. At that point, you now get a chance to sell yourself. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Okay. So then, so then after they they've done that quick selection, then they pretty much start to do the deep dives into the resume. Body. The deep dives. Now I'm looking for cultural fit. Mm -hmm. Where did he work at before? What was their culture like? Uh, what positions did he hold? How fast was he moving up the ladder? I like to see pay increases, mm. which means if you tell me you've been at this company for seven years, have I, is your pay different than what it was when you started? Mm. If it's significantly more, I know that they valued you. Right. So I do too. All right. So then let's, let, let's move on to the different components, you know, that, that you suggest, you know, based mm. on your experience and things like that. The different components that make up a good, or let's just say a a respectable, solid resume. Okay. Let's not say good or bad. Let's just say respectable and okay. solid. Something, something that will get selected. Something you get selected. Okay. Yeah. First component is your is your uh, basic demographic, your name, your address, where you came from, yada, yada. Second piece is, to me, where have you been and what have you been doing? That's when you see a little bit of the chronology. So I want to interject here because 
I was recently reading something where they were talking about um, the objective statement or I guess it's kind of yeah. like... Yeah, the target statement. Yeah. In other words, I am here to be wonderful. And you're com- I'm, I'm looking for a company where I can do whatever. Yeah, it's kind of like a teaser. Yeah. 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 If we're in HR, we go, yada, yada, that's good. Let's see what you can do. Ah. Uh, that does not... Now, it needs to be somewhere in the ballpark. I mean, I saw a cook apply to be a, a district manager on an oil rig. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm looking, yeah, I want to be a district manager on an oil rig. Well, you know, I want to be Superman, but what's your background? <laughs> well, I'm a cook. Well, he worked on rigs, but he had never been a, you know, he'd never been the guy that runs the whole shoot right, match. Right. So, come on, man. So, um, they're looking to see if you, you know, if you're sane, but that statement does not move them one way or the other. Does it help in terms of the, the keyword selection? Yes, it does. Okay. So yeah. helps in terms of keyword selection, but not necessarily a deal yeah. breaker. Emotionally, no. To. Emotionally, they're not going to be put off by that at all. Okay. Okay. So, name, chronology. Yes. Um, and then highlights. And here's where you really want to make sure you capture whatever's in that job description. Can you do the job? Mm-hmm. And that's what they want to see. Mm-hmm. Once you've done that, then comes your education part. This one is this one is tricky. You want to make sure that you show your education. But you don't want to overdo it to the point where it looks like you're going to be challenging them on any level. So if it's certain jobs, professional jobs, yeah, you got your degree, you got your advanced degree, go ahead and pop that in there. I would tell anybody, unless it's academia, leave your PhD out. Um, if you're a lawyer and you're going to a practice, you got a JD, there are some functions in a company we're a JD. Sometimes it's uh, labor law. You want to do that. But otherwise, you want to be very careful as you put that out because everything you write down just says, I am so good. I am this good. Therefore, here's what they're going to have certain expe- expectations of you because you wrote that down. Right. So, yes. Anything advanced, be very strategic in how you share that. So, we got name, chronology, don't necessarily need objective, which is good for keywords, but yes. not necessarily anything that's a deal breaker for absolutely further selection. Absolutely. So name, chronology, highlights, and education. education. Absolutely. Behind that, you want them to know who you are a little bit as a person, because almost everybody says, "Will this person fit culturally mm-hmm. in our uh, in our company?" If you do voluntary work and you do anything that helps other people, mm-hmm. it is a plus. If I look down and see that you work with the scouts or Big brother, big sister, you know, the boys club, uh, volunteer at a church youth group. Mm -hmm. That's a plus. I'm like, wow, I'm getting somebody of character. Because, of course, we want people uh, of ethics and integrity now. And that's almost becoming a lost lost cause in today's world. So if I look there and I see that you do something bigger than you Mm -hmm. and not just for you, it's a plus. That's solid, man. It, it works. That's solid. It works. So I'll use my own resume as an example. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. right. Uh, my resume is two pages, solid. Got it. So, I mean, solid two pages, right? I've been in my career, I think, going on 13 years. Mm-hmm. So, so here's the challenge, and I'm sure there are more people out there. Wherever there's a situation where you've worked for the same company, but it's gone through um, a few mergers, right? And the names of your company has changed multiple times. And as each merger has happened, you've gotten different positions that have been better than the last. So you, that that's Show that's progression. Showing, that's showing progression. Absolutely. Because I know, uh, you know, prior to uh, prior to recording, we were talking about it, and you were suggesting page to a page and a half. Mm-hmm. On two on is fine. Page. A staple is fine. A staple with an extra piece of paper behind it. Mm-hmm. Three pages is done. Three pages is they done. They will flip them. They'll, they'll read two. That that will not that will not be a deal, deal breaker on any okay, day. Okay, so cool. On, on a two-page resume, Yeah. what's popping out to you? What's exciting you? I want to see what you've done, and I want to see the impact. Now, here's what people do. People say, uh, I worked on this piece of software. Okay, next, I worked on this. I'm reading it going, so what? Mm-hmm. Now, if you write, I worked on this piece of software, which correct... Uh, an oversight issue that we had, which saved the company $12 million. I'm like, whoa. Right. Okay. I need to see the impact. Mm. Um, I'm a teacher. I taught special needs. 
Okay, that's what you did. That's why they hired you. However, taught special needs. 27% of my students were able to be uh, matriculated into the regular school uh, uh, milieu. I'm like, yo, yeah. you are good. So I don't care what your field is. I want to see the so what. And the so what is what jumps off the paper. You got you. One, one, one last question before we get out of here. So as we progress in our careers, the, the pool tend to shrink a little bit. Yes. In terms of opportunities and things like that. So once you get to that step right before you get into management, is there anything different that should be done to your resume? Yeah, you probably want to highlight your people management skills and your leadership skills. Because until you get into management, basically you are a skilled professional mm -hmm. who can make things happen. Gotcha. If you want to move into leadership, you've got to show how you can help other skilled professionals make things happen and give examples. So if you coached, you taught, you mentored, you were a team lead, uh, project lead, team lead, coach, those things tell me you are ready to be uh, ready to be a manager. Okay. As always, man, like, I, I learn a lot from these from these sessions, <laughs> man. Quick recap. This has been our episode on resumes, uh, taking taking a a look at the best best practices, formats, how the process works behind the scenes, and it's really like like we, we approach it not necessarily as a nuts and bolts thing, but we more approached it as uh, from a mental standpoint. Mm -hmm. How do we attack a resume? Absolutely. To to make sure we're putting ourselves in the best position to be selected and looked at because that's the goal. So basically what we have, we should look at our resumes as a commercial for ourselves. Absolutely. A trailer, you Absolutely. know, if you're into movies and such, right? Your show. Yeah, that's it. And then from there, you know, we talked about the selection process. You know, when, when we go on Indeed or when we go on Career Build, we go on Monster, you know, we, we go in and submit our resumes, what happens? So from there, some, you know, Brother Eric told us somebody, picks up those resumes. Um, they file them through a program that looks for keywords based on the position that they're trying to fill. And then from there, once it's there, then humans take over and they start the sorting process. Now, what they're looking at when they're sorting, they're, they're looking to put these resumes in three different piles, yes, no, or maybe. You definitely want to get to the yes. Because it, <laughs> Gives you an opportunity to go further. That's how you get the call. But what they look at grammatical errors, gr grammatical errors. Sorry, and that includes our names. I'm looking for inconsistencies mm -hmm. in your um, in your experience, and they're also looking for gaps in employment, and they're looking for length of service between all of your 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 um, your positions. From there, we we jumped into the different components that make up a solid resume. And the suggestion was that you have a good header. So that's where your name and address things go in. Make sure, you know, your name um, stands out and it's easily readable. If you have a name that may be difficult to pronounce, it's best to just use initials. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, we have, uh, as humans, we have prejudices and things like that. So, you know, it's just part of the game that has to be played just to make sure that we can get to the next step. Mm -hmm. Once they get to know you, doesn't matter. Next, um, you want to start with your chronology. What have you done and what's the impact? After that, you want to make sure that you are highlighting some of your big accomplishments over the years at each position. And one of the things that I learned today was every process that you do at work has an impact. It's just not always the big showy impact. Absolutely. So you can find a way to word it to make sure that it, so that the, the reader knows what type of impact your everyday process had. Absolutely. Lastly, education. Where did you go? What degrees do you have? Be mindful that depending on the position um, that you're not, you don't have to list all of your degrees. Um, because you may run into a situation where you may be more educated than your doing your employer. Again, there are some prejudices. Some people look down on that. So just be mindful of the situation. Threatened. Yeah, they may be threatened. Mm -hmm. Just be mindful of that. And that may be one of the things that you can can take to your mentor, and you can go back and listen to the previous episode on mentoring 
And then, you know, if, uh, after that, this is optional. If, you have, if you're doing volunteer work, they want to know um, culturally how you would fit in their company. So if you're doing volunteer work or things like that, they want to know a little bit about you. So you can stick that on the tail end. Uh-huh. As a bonus, the objective session section, which um, I know a lot of people use, including myself, um, it's good for keywords, but it's not a make or break in terms of getting your resume further selected. Is that it? Got one more last one. Go. This one hit me mm-hmm. only because I didn't want to bust out laughing. <laughs> Please get a regular email address. Do not put <laughs> on your resume at divagirl.com uh, or bigballershotcaller.com. Don't do that. That's comedy for a recruiter and it's a non call for you. Clean up that email. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> that is important. <laughs> I'm Brian Montgomery and Eric Kelly. That's it. And we'll see you guys next week. Mm